Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SpudSmart Innovation Series webinar. My name is Ashley Robinson, and I'm the editor of SpudSmart. Today, I'll be serving as your host for this webinar. The theme for today's webinar is using is controlling Colorado potato beetles on your farm. This webinar is brought to you by the Canadian Potato Council. The Canadian Potato Council received funding for today's webinar through the Canadian Horticultural Council as part of the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Our presenters for this webinar are Chandra Moffat, who is a research scientist in etymology with AAFC in Summerland, BC. Ian Scott, who is a research scientist in etymology and insecticide toxicology with AAFC at the London Research and Development Centre, and Sheldon Hahn, land resource support biologist with AAFC in Fredericton, New Brunswick. In today's webinar, you'll learn about the late blight prevention and management strategies, how researchers are forecasting late blight risk, how researchers are identifying late blight strains, and how late blight can spread among plants. During the webinar, you'll likely have some questions for our speakers. Please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we'll address them during the question and answer session after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available at spudsmart.com following this live event. Chandra's research program centers on the agroecology of insect pests and the cropping systems they impact. Her work strives to develop knowledge of the ecology and evolution of both insects and plants across a variety of agricultural systems to develop sustainable pest management strategies. Her research group integrates approaches from natural history, ecology, taxonomy, and molecular genetics to develop new integrated pest management tools. She, focus on, she focuses on development of Biological control based methods for invasive insects, the biolog biological control of invasive wet weeds, as well as characterizing and delaying the development of insecticide resistance. Ian studies the effects of insect insecticides and plant derived metabolics on pest insects with a focus on vegetable crops. His expertise includes insecticide resistance, biopesticide discovery, plant insect interactions, and chemical ecology. His current project focuses on wireworm, Colorado potato beetle, two-spotted spider mites, and the effect of cover crops on soil invertebrate biodiversity. Ian is the lead uh, author on a recent publication entitled, Protemic Analysis Detect Higher Expression of C-Type Lectins in Amecalipide Resistant Colorado Potato Beetle, Colorado Potato Beetle Leptina, and I cannot say that full title. And last but not least, uh, Sheldon graduated from the University of New Brunswick in 2005 with a Bachelor of Science in Forestry with a specialization in Geomatics. He started his career with AFC in 2005 as a soil and land resource technician, where he provided field, lab, and geomatic support to the soil, air, and water quality research teams at the FRDC. From 2016 to 2019, he acted in the Integrated Cropping Systems Scientist role as a biologist and was principal investigator for two research projects. In 2019, he began his per current position as the principal as the lead for the Land Resource Support U Unit located at FRDC. In his current role, Sheldon provides GIS and geomatics support for various research teams across the Atlantic provinces on a wide variety of research projects. He provides research project data compilation, management, analysis, and visualization through the use of a variety of software and analysis techniques, including artificial intelligence. Sheldon has successfully developed mapping applications and map products through various GIS platforms that are integral in decision-making, fulfilling project requirements, engaging with shareholders, and knowledge transfer services. Now, please take it away, guys. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. So this is Chandra. Hello, everyone. And yes, we'll be speaking to you today about our project on insecticide resistance management for Colorado potato beetle and controlling uh, CBs on your farm. I'll give the first part of the presentation, then I'll pass it over to Ian and then Sheldon, and then I'll be finishing off. So I just wanted to, to take a minute to introduce the project team. So we're based, um, it's researchers based with both Agriculture Canada and the Université de Moncton uh, from the Fredericton Research Centre. That's where we started the project and I had been based there at the time. 
Dr. Jess Vickrock uh, took over my role there and she's supported by Pam McKinley and Sheldon will be speaking to you later. He's also at Fredericton. At the London Center, we have Ian Scott on uh, the webinar today and Sophie uh, Kurlikowski works with him. And then Cam Donnelly and another technician, m &A, uh, they work on the molecular genetics portion uh, in collaboration with Pierre Morin at the University of Moncton. So I just wanted to shout out to them for their amazing work, as well as our fabulous team of students that we've had over the last few, few years who really make the work possible. Of course, the work is only possible thanks to our partners. So the project is funded by the Canadian Horticultural Council through the Canadian Agricult Agricultural Partnership Cluster 3. We have so many amazing supporters like Cavendish Farms and McCain Foods, uh, PEI Potato Board, Ontario Potato Board, uh, Producers in Quebec, Peak of the Market, MPEC, and Potato Growers of Alberta. And then uh, the photos here are our wonderful partners across Canada who really are our, our people on the ground who work, um, they really work directly with the growers and assist us in the collections of the Colorado potato beetles that we need for the study. So huge thanks to Ryan, Lorraine, Dennis, Marie, Pascal, Tracy, and Shelley. Without their partnership, this project, it absolutely would not be possible. So I think if you've tuned into this webinar today that you know that Colorado potato beetles are incredibly important in, in potato production, but I mean, you, you have so many competing interests uh, to deliver an amazing potato crop. So it's only, only one foe. Um, you may or may not know they're they're not native to this part of North America. So they're native to South America and to Mexico. And they're native to a, a plant called buffalo burr, which is a, a native plant in that region. It's a bit weedy. Uh, many solanum plants, uh, so potato and these other plants are in the family Solanaceae. They can be very weedy. Uh, and Colorado potato beetle followed these weedy plants up into the United States and when potato began uh, cultivation, um, the sort of potato we have now, of course, uh, in Texas and other parts of the US, Colorado potato beetle was able to move from the weedy host plants onto cultivated potato, and it's followed cultivated potato into Canada and other regions of the world. It's an incredibly important economic past of potato around the world, uh, certainly in Eastern Canada, and you know, I'm sure Manitoba would put up their hand and say, and that region as well. Uh, so that's just a little bit about the origin of the beetle. And just keep in mind that if you have uh, weedy Solanaceae uh, around your farm or uh, volunteer potato, that those are important to control when trying to manage Colorado potato beetle as well. I'm sure many of you know very well the life history of the Colorado potato beetle. So in Canada, we, we generally have sort of we say one to two generations per year because usually that second generation doesn't complete development. So um, the adults overwinter, of course, in the soil in potato fields. So crop rotation is always really important to minimize damage. They emerge in the spring alongside uh, growing potato. Even sometimes they can be out a little bit in, uh, in advance. Um, adults can distribute, of course, but they prefer to, to stay home if possible. They'll lay their eggs primarily on the underside of the leaf. Sometimes you see them on the, the overside as well. Those hatch into, you know, these cute little squishy red larvae that uh, we as entomologists love. They grow through uh, four life stages or instars, and that's when really they're, they're super destructive and they eat so much of the potato foliage. The adults as well will really feed on the foliage. Um, in Canada, we then get the start of a second generation, more egg laying, more larval feeding and they generally don't complete development. And it's the first generation adults that overwinter. But with changing climates, I do, I do worry that we may uh, move to two complete generations or even in other parts of the US, they, they do get three generations per year. So with changing climates, something to be aware of. So the control of Colorado potato beetle, you know, it's, it's such a decimating insect pest. There's been many different control strategies uh, tried over time. As I mentioned, crop rotation is incredibly important to try to minimize the losses and minimize um, the buildup of Colorado potato beetle populations. Trenching is, is another one. And um, mine and Jessica's predecessor at Fredericton, Jill Boiteau and Evan Peltier, they had done many different studies um, in developing cultural and physical controls for Colorado potato beetle. 
However, we're still really left uh, with relying on chemical control. Uh, this, of course, can be uh, in furrow or foliar sprays. Um, and as I, I mentioned with crop rotation, uh, crop rotation is incredibly important to delay the development of insecticide resistance. We, we all know that insecticide resistance is really a huge problem for the Colorado potato beetle, more so than many other insects. There's a, a few reasons why this is, but really, um, it's really to do with the fact that Colorado potato beetle has, has evolved on such a toxic group of host plants. So potato and other members of the Solanaceae are very toxic and it's very difficult for insects to metabolize those toxins. So to be successful um, on these crops, uh, insects like Colorado potato beetle have had to really evolve very strong mechanisms of responding to toxins. That's meant that the Colorado potato beetle is really one of the world's most adaptive pests uh, it evolved resistance to DDT early on. It's result, uh, evolved resistance to pretty much every chemical that's been thrown its way. And there's many different genetic and genomic mechanisms that lead to insecticide resistance, which makes it a very difficult insect to target. So for, for our research study, we put this project together in uh, 2016 and 2017. And at that time, there was a lot of concern about the loss of registration for neonicotinoid insecticides, which are, of course, the primary class that's been used to control Colorado potato beetle in Canada for the, the last um, several years, as well as we know that there are new insecticides coming onto market. And we really didn't have a good sense of how beetle populations in the field, particularly in different regions of Canada, how they would respond to these different insecticides. So the first of objective of our project was to really work to empirically determine the susceptibility of the different beetle populations across Canada in different regions to different classes of insecticides through our national resistance monitoring network. So this had been started by Ian Scott and years prior, and we really worked to expand this network and ensure it had a really regional focus so that growers would be able to have information at their fingertips about the development of insecticide resistance in their region. So that really led us to work to develop this novel extension tool and interactive mapping tool for Colorado potato beetle insecticide resistance. And Sheldon, I'll speak to you about that. As well, a large part of the project, but we'll just give it a little bit of airtime today, is work to better characterize the molecular basis of developing resistance, particularly to compounds that are used in Canada. And so that's work that Cam and Pierre do, and I'll just touch on it briefly at the end. I'll pass it over to Ian now. Uh, thanks, uh, Chandra. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to address uh, that first objective, <clears throat> which is uh, our uh, survey of insecticide susceptibility to Colorado potato beetle uh, populations in five provinces and uh, three different classes of insecticides uh, <clears throat> over a, a five year period of the project. So uh, between 2018 and 2020, uh, Colorado potato beetle collections, uh, both adult and late instar larvae were made from uh, 72 conventional and research potato fields in major production regions in <clears throat> Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Prince Edward Island um, at the locations shown on the, uh, the map. Uh, this past summer, uh, a further 31 uh, populations were collected in these same regions. We haven't added those uh, locations on this map yet. Um, those populations were uh, sent uh, to either London, Ontario, where I'm located, or uh, Fredericton, where uh, Jess and Pam are. And that's where, <clears throat> that's where these populations were maintained and where the testing, the insecticide bioassay testing was completed. So we use, uh, have used for a long time, a leaf dip bioassay to determine the lethal concentration for, uh, that causes 90% mortality or what's called the, the LC90 for the, uh, 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 products in three insecticide classes, the neonicotinoids, the spinosins, and the anthranolic diamides. We use a second instar larvae, <clears throat> uh, and we uh, determine this LC90 with a susceptible laboratory strain. So it's a, 
um, a potato beetle that's been uh, kept maintained for a long time in uh, in the lab and not exposed to insecticides. Uh, the insecticides tested with this diagnostic concentration were the Neonix Octara and Titan, the Spinosins Delegate and Entrust, and the Diamides Corrigin and Bearmark. The, remain, the range of the susceptibility to each of these insecticides was determined with a minimum of 60 larvae from each of the populations. This, uh, the resulting percent mortality uh, was then integrated into a, a Bayesian geostatistical model that extrapolates predictions across uh, both space and time, and it estimates uh, spatio-temporal correlation structure in the, of these observations. The results are then plotted for each insecticide class in each province uh, over the four years up to date um, in order to show, and, and we show this uh, via the mean percent mortality and confidence lim limits around that, that mean. Um, we requested information on prior insecticide use. So this uh, from each, uh, collection site. So this use history um, uh, indicated that neonicotinoids were the most prevalent product that had been applied uh, compared to spinosins and diamides. At the initiation of the project, we were testing octarins, titan, and corrigin, uh, because these were used commonly as seed or in furrow treatments, while the spinosins were uh, applied as foliar sprays. In 2020, we learned from um, our collaborating uh, potato growers that they were interest, rather interested in having us work with XRL rather than Veramark. Both uh, have the same active ingredient. <clears throat> so we switched um, testing to, to XRL uh, last year. Um, and then just this year, it was suggested that we um, also include two new registered diamide products, Harvanta and Viego, in our, in our survey. So we did that. Uh, we continue to use Titan and Trust and Delegate, since these are products that are, are commonly applied. So I'm going to go through uh, a series of figures now, which will uh, provide results of our, um, our bioassay results. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so they... The figures will show the average percent mortality for all of the potato beetle populations tested from the five provinces. The graphs combine data for uh, two products within each insecticide class um, and over the four years. So in this case, this first graph, we can see the results for Prince Edward Island. And here, most of the populations uh, over the four years remain susceptible to Octara and Titan. Since the mean mortality um, which is along the, um, the left side, um, is relatively high still, so above 70%. Um, the modeling of this data uh, determined there was no effect over the four years for the neonics, no change. Uh, in this graph, uh, most populations remain uh, susceptible to entrust and delegate from P again from PEI, but uh, this past season uh, there appears to be a, a greater range of mortality observed. So that's in the 2021 year. The model again determined no effect of year for the spinosins. Uh, PEI populations uh, were also considered to remain susceptible to the diamides. Although in 2021, it appears that there's, there may be reduced susceptibility to the XRL that was tested. So in this case, um, this data is just showing the results for uh, the response to XRL with PEI populations. But the second graph, we are including the results for Harvanta and uh, Viego. So they're shifting the percent mortality higher so that these new products, it looks like they're, the populations that were tested are more, um, more susceptible to them. Moving into Quebec, um, again, the model determined no effect of year over the 
the four years that have been <clears throat> where we have data uh, for the neonics. And the susceptibility is, is similar to what we saw for PEI, but perhaps a, for the mean, but the, the range of response seems to be greater. Uh, with the spinosids, um, there appears to be uh, reduced susceptibility compared to what we saw in PEI. So the, the mean percent mortality has shifted below 70%. Sorry if I'm moving quickly through these, but there'll be definitely opportunities to ask questions at the, at the end. Uh, for the uh, diamides, um, uh, we saw no effect of year. Again, it, it appears like this past year, there is a, a, a reduction in the susceptibility to the uh, to diamides, to XRL in this case. Uh, but when we include the Harvanta uh, and Viego data, we see that shift to uh, to uh, higher susceptibility. So these new products seem to be um, a little more effective than the XRL. Here we are in uh, looking at Ontario data now. Uh, the model again uh, determined no effective year with the neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids, but a larger range of I think you're cutting out a bit, just to let you know. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. And uh, with the uh, spinosids, these results, uh, we also observe a larger mortality range than what we saw with uh, P in PEI. Uh, with the diamide results, there appears to be a trend toward resistance. Uh, but again, this, the model showed no effect of year. And again, with the uh, Harvanta and Viego, a shift in susceptibility uh, when those products are included. Here we are looking at Manitoba. We observed with Manitoba neonic results that uh, there was the largest uh, reduction in susceptibility uh, of all the provinces that were uh, where populations were tested. And uh, with the spinosins, there seems to be a similar trend to what we were seeing with, uh, with the results in Ontario. Diamide bioassay results were also similar to those of Ontario. And there we have the Harvanta and Viego results again. Finally, moving into Alberta, um, potato beetle populations were only collected for two years there. Um, the test with neonicotinoids indicates that Alberta populations were the most susceptible from of all the provinces that were tested. This was also the case with the spinosins and the dimides. So uh, the statistical modeling uh, with the four years of data is still ongoing. For this presentation, this presentation, we thought it was more interesting to present our findings to highlight the insecticide susceptibility trends over the four years of the survey. Prior to this year, a focus on PEI and Quebec populations between 2018 and 2020 indicated there was an interaction between insecticide and province. For, for example, in Quebec, Entrust was found to be less effective. This may be due to its greater use in organic potato pest management. In contrast, Titan and Vermark Ver were more effective. However, as we saw in the previous slides, there was no overall effective year for these provinces. The most important conclusion to draw from the survey results so far is knowing which insecticides are working, are working well in your region. The next part of the project will demonstrate how the team is developing new ways to share the regional information with the growers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sheldon, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah, so 
The next portion of the uh, presentation will look at activity two um, with myself, uh, the development of the interactive online mapping tool for growers to access results of the survey um, to help inform that local decision making for optimal uh, insecticide selection. And here's just a uh, image of the uh, online mapping tool. I'll go through it in detail uh, in the following slides. So before we develop the online mapping tool, we first have to uh, choose the mapping platform. Uh, we selected the mapping platform of ArcGIS Online. It's a cloud-based software developed by ESRI, a uh, company out of California, uh, to create and, and it's used to create and share interactive web maps. Some of the key features include supported, it's supported and extensively used by academia, industry, government, and non-government agencies. The software has a living atlas, which uh, allows for reliable up-to-date data sources. Um, it also has access to open data, which enhances that user, that end user experience, as well as uh, it's easy to use navigation. Um, it has the look and feel of uh, Google Earth or Google Maps. So once the mapping platform was selected, the next uh, process was to compile the data. So what we had done is we had used Microsoft Excel to compile the lab data that was collected from the insecticide bioassays as well as all of the survey information such as the location the latin long uh, for each uh, sampling location the field history what crop was planted there as well as any of the product use history so we compiled all that data um, into excel which resulted in just this is just a screenshot of uh, the sample database that we had. So you can see on in the column A, there's a, a unique ID. That's the year um, the sample was collected as well as the colony that was collected. There's a Latin long expected insect pressure. Uh, for the neonics, there's uh, some field use history there, as well as in the bottom of that uh, slide, you can see from column AF to BA, you can see that there is the insecticide resistance uh, results there. So percent of mortality as well as the rating that goes along with that mortality. So once we had the database uh, developed, we then transferred it or imported it into ArcGIS Pro, which is a, another ESRI product. Um, this data was then uh, incorporated into the spatial location. So using the lats and longs, we uh, use that as the, uh, to geographically represent the data. Uh, we then produced annual primary and secondary vector features uh, to represent that data and to depict the results from each of the insecticide bioassays, those six products. Um, and then we use the susceptibility classes uh, as the basis of the feature symbology. So, uh, Susceptibility, susceptible uh, classification was any of the sites that had 100 to 70% mortality, uh, 70 to 30% mortality were classified as less susceptible, and less than 30% uh, mortality was classified as resistant. So in this, in the, on the slide, you can see that on the left-hand side, there's a map of the sampling locations uh, for each individual year. Um, just like I, I, Ian had uh, up earlier, and you can see that the 2021 um, uh, data set is not incorporated yet. We just have the three years so far. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see an example of the interest susceptibility uh, for those same sampling locations. So once the data was uh, compiled within ArcGIS Pro, all those data sets were published to as web layers to that ArcGIS online environment under AAFC's Agriculture and Agriculture Canada's enterprise license. So the, the data is housed in uh, AAFC right now. Uh, and then a web mapping application was created from those web layers and currently depicts the results of from 86 sampling locations over those three years from 2018 to 2020 across the six Canadian provinces. With PEI with 15 sites, New Brunswick 12, Quebec 21, Ontario 15, Manitoba 20, and Alberta 3. 
So here is a uh, screenshot of that web mapping application. So when you open up the web mapping application, this is the screen that you're looking at. Um, and you can see along the top there, the title, as you move down the side on the left-hand side, you can see some buttons there. I'll go over what some of those uh, mean, just uh, the functionality of the tool, some of the features. Uh, you can see the plus and minus sign. So that's where you can zoom in and zoom out. It's the same as Google Earth or Google Maps, where you can also scroll with your mouse to move in and out. Uh, the home button brings you back to this view. Uh, and then you can see the a circle with the uh, crosshairs uh, in it just under the home screen. And that will uh, allow you to choose your to detect your location if you have location services on a mobile device or a laptop and you open up the web mapping application. Uh, along the bottom, you can see a little tab on the, on the bottom there. That's actually the attribute table that you can look at for any of the data sets that you currently have loaded onto the web mapping application. So just to go over some of those uh, options or features on that left-hand side, um, so in the background, you see that uh, there is the web mapping application. Uh, and then if you look at the top left-hand side, you'll see uh, four squares that are in a larger square. That's uh, the options for base map gallery. So some users may not want to have the imagery in the background. They may want like a, a gray background or a gray uh, base map uh, or labels on there as well. So you can... Uh, you can actually choose that uh, that base map to change that. Um, there's another option as well. If you, it's a little hard to see, but uh, there are some squares that are layered on top of one another uh, on the left hand side on the ribbon. Um, that is the layer list. So that's all the layers that are currently loaded into the web mapping application, and they include the Aptera, Corrigin, Delegate, Entrust, Titan, and Veramark results as well as the overall uh, data set for the CPB survey. And that uh, shows up as well if you click that button. But the, the next one down below that is the legend. Um, and that just will display the legend for any of the data sets that you currently have turned on uh, within the web mapping application. Uh, and then the other one that I have here on the screen is the chart. So there's actually an option to choose and it'll create a chart for you. Uh, you can either choose the uh, Colorado, Colorado potato beetle min, max, or mean mortality percent uh, for any given province, uh, for any given product um, that is found within the data set. So the chart I have up here right now is the mean mortality percent for uh, CPB across the, the country. So the x-axis has the different provinces. Uh, the y-axis is the mean mortality percent, and then the different colors represent the different products. So you can get an idea of how it looks across the country. So then if we just zoom into one location, for example, um, in Quebec, uh, we're in Quebec right now. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the functionality within the uh, uh, mapping tool. So if we open up that, uh, the attribute table on the bottom of our screen uh, using that tab, it'll actually open the database, the polygon attribute table or point attribute table for any of the sites that are in our field of view. Uh, we can also click on any one of those uh, points and get the attributes of that point. So for example, I clicked on the red point here in uh, one of the Quebec sites and it opens up a window that you can scroll through and look at the attributes. And it actually shows a little hard to see on the screen right here, but it's uh, the Actera is 29% uh, mortality rate for that one location, which gives a resistant rating. And then on the left-hand side, we can also open up the chart um, as well, and it will give us the uh, mean, min, and max mortality rate for uh, the province as well. So right now it has the Quebec uh, mean mortality rate um, for all of the sites within Quebec, uh, for all of the different products. Um, so here, for example, you have the Actera mortality of 29%, showing the resistant rating, and the mean mortality rate for Actera is the light blue bar, and it's at about 55%. So it just helps give an overview of the province as well.
So then if we just work through some of the maps that uh, we have created um, for the data set. So here is a uh, gray background with all the, the sampling locations across Canada with some uh, zoomed in areas. The upper left-hand side is in Manitoba, the lower left-hand side in uh, Southern Ontario, the upper right-hand side in Quebec, and the lower right-hand side is in uh, PEI. So if we look at the N-Trust susceptibility right now is up on the screen, you can see that there is resistance uh, in sites in uh, Manitoba as well as in Quebec. If we look at delegate, uh, we are showing the resistance sites in Manitoba as well as in Quebec again with the Southern Ontario and PEI sites showing less susceptible and resistant. Less susceptible and uh, susceptible, sorry. The, uh, if we look at the Veramark, the, the diamides susceptibility, uh, you can see that there is resistance showing up in Manitoba and Southern Ontario with the Quebec and PEI sites showing less susceptible and susceptible. Uh, and then if we look at the Corrigin, uh, we see a similar trend where we see the uh, resistance showing up in Manitoba as well as in uh, Southern uh, Ontario with the susceptible and less susceptible sh uh, showing up for the sites in PEI and Quebec. So then what are the, what are the next steps? Um, the next steps for uh, the web mapping application is to incorporate the 2021 data, uh, as well as the survey data, as well as the uh, lab results, um, compile that, create those uh, data sets, update those, um, feature data sets and, and online web maps, as well as uh, further develop those data sets to ensure the privacy prior to stakeholder access. So before we can, uh, we can have this data set public facing, we have to make sure that we ensure the privacy of those sampling locations. So this is where we, we will dissolve out those sampling locations, individual sampling locations, whether that is to a eco district, um, or through a uh, vector data set or a raster data set, kind of like what you're, what you're seeing right now, the pixelated surface across a given area showing the uh, mortality percent. As well, we'll uh, look at uh, collaboration with AgroGeomatics, which, which is the uh, geomatics group within AAFC. Uh, and we will work with them to have our data sets and our mapping application public facing, open that up to uh, the stakeholders, the growers, uh, and then have an information session with the stakeholders to talk about does the uh, data products work for the industry and uh, how can we improve uh, these data sets in the web mapping application. And I'll throw it back to Chandra. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sheldon. And there was just an early question come in, so I'll just, like Sheldon was explaining, so the way that the end use tool will be is that all of the locations will be generalized, anonymized, and we have a diff different ways of doing that. So we'll be looking for input on which visual presentation sort of works best for people. And so in the front facing, public facing, all the locations will be anonymous and it's just uh, the researchers and the very close partners who work directly uh, with the growers on the beetle collections that know the locations of where the populations were collected from. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a quick overview of the third part of our project and that's really investigating different molecular signatures of insecticide resistance. And so, like I mentioned, there's there's many different possible um, genetic and genomic mechanisms that can lead to the evolution of insecticide resistance. And so Colorado potato beetle, as it spread through North America, I don't have this on the slide, I just thought I would give it for context. Um, it's been uh, exposed to different pressures in the environment. We call them selective pressures from an evolutionary perspective, but they've different populations have had um, different intensification of potato production. They've had different climate and weather regimes. They've had different insecticide use history. 
And so for, for all of those different reasons, we end up with populations of Colorado potato beetle in Canada that while they share that common like distant uh, evolutionary history, their, their more recent evolutionary history has been quite different. And so that's why we can really see differences in the uh, response of the beetles to different insecticides on a, on a regional basis and even a bit on a local basis because they've been treated to different uh, different conditions, particularly different insecticides and different intensification of insecticides. So some of the mechanisms uh, that uh, Cam Donnelly and Pierre Morin are working on are looking at uh, RNA molecules. Uh, a lot of these small uh, variations in RNA really underpin the response of different insects to uh, evolve insecticide resistance. And so for Colorado potato beetle, as I mentioned, there's many different ways it can evolve resistance, but are there particular RNAs that are triggered that are maybe more common to the development of insecticide resistance, even if it's in different gene regions? And then some of the work that we want uh, to look at from there and work that we've already started is looking if particular uh, insecticide responses can be altered. So sorry, uh, someone just knocked at my door. So my dog does not like that. Come here. Can be altered if we can specifically target those particular genes or RNAs. So those particular targets, they could be really uh, targeted specifically, those molecular targets to really have a direct impact on Colorado potato beetle and hopefully increase sensitivity of beetles to particular compounds. So that's in brief what we're working on. And then we can produce these, these really beautiful plots. So this is work out of Pierre's lab at Umoncton. And so really just what it's showing in a different sense here is we have different populations of Colorado potato beetle. In this case, on the left and on the right, it's Ontario and Quebec respectively. So different sites where beetles had been collected and we can see that there's different genetic responses in different Colorado, Colorado potato beetle populations, even within a province. And so, for instance, in the Quebec populations, we can see um, that this last population shows quite a more uh, strict response in terms of regulation of these molecules that are sensitive or resistant to entrust. But we can start to see this orange signal develop, developing in other populations. So these genetic tools, they can really be used to help us better interpret the insecticide resistance bioassays and give us a more specific look at which molecules are responsible. Some, some new work that, uh, that we have that's just in review at a journal right now is also out of Pierre's lab. And in this plot, it looks kind of confusing, but he's looking at uh, time uh, of the beetles uh, response to cloth cyanidin and the number of beetles that survive. And so by uh, using RNA interference-based targeting of particular genes, he's able to show that there's actually increased sensitivity towards cloth cyanidin. So that means the beetles can become more susceptible to the insecticide if they're targeted with RNA interference. So the work that Cam and Pierre are doing together is really looking at different genetic mechanisms and trying to identify these different, what we call novel gene targets for development of novel um, genetic tools such as RNA interference to improve susceptibility to insecticides. So moving forward, um, we're entering next year uh, in April into the last year of this particular project. Uh, we'd really like to continue the resistance monitoring because the resistance you know, in some regions to some insecticides, Ian showed there weren't year effects, but in certain regions, um, the effect, you know, of the insecticide changing, um, the beetle's response changing over time is really, really important to monitor. And we've developed the, the mapping tool, as Sheldon mentioned, for release to growers and be having some more targeted um, engagement uh, platforms so that we can get feedback on the tool. And uh, really, we're just at, really at the beginning of um, developing these novel targets for molecular-based tools to help uh, increase susceptibility of the beetle to different insecticides. So really hoping that we'll have the opportunity to continue that work going forward as well. So we just wanted to finish by again, thanking um, the whole team and all of our partners and in particular, uh, really the growers who uh, allow us, to, who do the collections and allow our partners to come and collect beetles uh, without those uh, beetle populations, we wouldn't be able to produce uh, this work for you all. So thank you so much.
Thank you, Chandra, Ian, and Sheldon. You guys did a great job there. And now I'd like to do a short qu question and answer session. So if you have a question for either, for any of our presenters that you haven't typed in yet, please type it in the chat box now. So our first question is uh, from one of our viewers and it's asking any reason which could be attributed to CPB bop CPB bop populations in Alberta are, that are more successful to for insecticides compared to populations in other provinces? So thank you for the question. And I think I got at this a little bit, uh, but uh, Ian, if you had any other thoughts to share, uh, to elaborate on what I said or... Yeah, I, I, I think some of the uh, populations we received, certainly this year, um, <clears throat> the information on prior insecticide use suggests that maybe they um, those particular ones hadn't been exposed to uh, um, some of or all of the uh, insecticides we're testing. I, I can't remember exactly off, off the top of my head what the growers in those particular particular locations were using, but it, um, yeah, it, it seemed like um, that that would probably be re partly responsible for their, why those Alberta populations seem to be more susceptible to the neonics and uh, the other two uh, classes. Thank you, Ian. And we have another question. This one's from Kate Vanderzag, and she's asking, how close are the targeted, uh, how close are the targeted are the populations? Any answers? <laughs> uh, well, they're uh, in Ontario, certainly they're, um, they can be fairly distant from each other. Uh, I think we have populations in um, sort of this, western part of the province or not uh, southwestern part of the province and then uh, some that are north of toronto so uh, it can be quite far apart uh kate did uh, offer clarification in the chat she just said she's just wondering if you're seeing a distance trend for population variations um kate i'm not i'm not sure exactly how to address that question but what i would say is we do see like like spatial autocorrelation so populations that are more close to each other they're more likely to be more similar in terms of the patterns or the trends in response to insecticide but we could see in the tool preview that sheldon was providing that even on really um, close spatial scales when we have beetle populations that have been collected relatively close to each other in the order of dozens or a couple hundred kilometers um, that we do see that there can be very different responses so in general we see some similarities in responses based on region but we can see quite different responses and i think uh jess vickrack who's our researcher at fredericton she can add a little more context into the chat as well on that Thank you. And I have a question for myself. Uh, just one, one thing that I was wondering about when you guys were talking about how you changed some of the products that you've been using uh, in your trials. Have you guys heard of any other um, new or upcoming products that might help with uh, cholera potato beetle control? Well, those were the those two products, the Harvanta and Viego, were the ones that we were identified as being um, definitely of interest to uh, to growers. But uh, I believe there's some other products uh, in the pipeline. Good to hear. And we have another viewer question. This one is from Violetta Marquez. How effective are alternative slash non chemical methods such as traps to prevent damage of uh, potato cultures. Yeah, I can I can take that a little bit. Um, overall, overall, most of the uh, alternative methods that have been had been researched, they can be effective. Trenching can be effective. It's it's really just that it's so labor intensive and not super compatible with with commercial production, but. 
if you're a grower who works, works on a smaller scale or maybe an organic grower, um, or maybe you're, you're, you're growing, you know, certain really high value um, varieties um, for special markets, then it, it may be worth that the effort to implement some cultural and physical controls. It's, they're just not really feasible at the large scale. Thank you, uh, Chandra. I have another question from Dave Bell, and he's asking, is New Brunswick participating in the collections? I'll take that one as well. And uh, the the New Brunswick uh, potato growers, you know, they had so many, so many priorities to consider when this project was funded that they, uh, you know, very justified, uh, had other other projects that were a higher priority. So they weren't able to participate in, in our project. Uh, what we've done because we have our Fredericton Research Center is we've uh, done our own collections at our research farm in Fredericton and our sister farm that's up in the, more in the potato growing region. As well, we've had collections from some of our, our partners from McCain's uh, in New Brunswick. So we've been able to look at beetles from just those few select populations from our partners. Thank you. And I have a question from, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Galbahar Arakan. And he's at, and they're asking, uh, what do you think about small RNA technology? This techno is this technology economical for farmers? Can you give examples? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And honestly, we're we're far too early in this project to be able to really make any any assessment there. There are other projects that are being conducted for other insects uh, in the U.S., like European corn borer, um, and you know, I'm, I, the RNAi technology. Some of them can be expensive for sure, and a lot of them are still in research phases. So, in terms of getting those products to market, uh, that's really past the the research phase, and it's a really important question. But um, I'd be interested to you know have conversations with with our partners about that and how those products would be rolled out. And it's not the the economics of it or something that uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with. And I I think it, they're really important conversations to have. Thank you. And we have a question from Dennis Van Dyke, and he's asking, would you consider adding older chemistries, uh, for example, group one or three insecticides to see if previously resistant populations may become su su uh, susceptible again? Ian, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I know we we have talked about that. I guess we were sort of limited in the scope of our, our the current project to be able to do that. Um, or uh, time-wise, resource-wise. Um, I know collaborators in uh, Quebec were interested in doing that. They are, are also working on insecticide resistance there in potato beetles, so uh, they may very well have included uh, some of the older chemistries, but uh, we weren't able to do it this in this project. Yeah, that's super interesting. And uh, well, that's all we have time for today. And I'd like to once again, thank our speakers, Chandra, Ian and Sheldon for joining us. And I would let, once again, like to thank our partner, the Canadian, pa Canadian Potato Council for making this webinar possible. And of course, a big thank you go also goes out to everyone for participating. I hope you have found this information valuable. Again, a recording of this webinar will be made available on spudsmart.com. Thanks, and we hope you have a wonderful day.